Good afternoon and welcome to Fortress Press Live, where we connect you with the people and passions behind the books we publish here at Fortress Press. During the 2014 American Academy of Religion and Society of Biblical Literature Conference in San Diego, we brought together several of our Seminarium Elements authors to discuss their books. This is part three of our discussion and it features Holly Ingalls discussing her book, Sticky Learning, How Neuroscience Supports Teaching That's Remembered. I come to this from a little different place. I work in the world of praxis, not in the world of academia. Um, I've had the privilege of working with, and in fact being, a seminary graduate. (laughs) Congratulations. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, And you still believe. I didn't say that. Let's not go there, Pat. What I found in my own seminary education and in working with a number of seminary graduates from a variety of seminaries is What we learn in a seminary classroom is good, and it's good for a variety of reasons, but it doesn't stick with us. It doesn't stick with me, didn't stick with me. And I had some really great professors and really exciting classes. Uh, In about 2008, through my husband's educational school that he was working with, I became exposed to a book by John Medina called Brain Rules. If you've not read that book, I would commend that to you. Medina is a molecular neurobiologist in Seattle. He's a Presbyterian, and he's written this very palatable book on how the brain works. Mark was reading it because the school he was working with, they used it for their continuing education for their teaching staff, and he said, you need to read this book. In my introductory seminar of my doctoral program, Brain Rules was on the reading list. And I read it then, and I said, The church needs this information. So I began a several-year process of delving into neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience, and applying it to the realm of church. I've hung out with some amazing neuroscientists who looked at me and said, "Um, why are you here? (laughs) And they were in conversation with educators. Although that's a recent conversation, neuroscientists talking to educators. And they looked at me from the church. I mean, my name tag says, Welsher Church. And they said, why are you here? And I said, because we need to be a voice at the table too. So we're behind. So what can we do to catch up? So as I said, I come to this from the world of praxis. So I love the academy. I love the world of wor- the world of words. I love engaging with that. But at some point, the rubber has to meet the road. And we have to make what we learn practical. So that's what I attempted to do in the book. I took what I have explored over the past five to six years in the world of neuroscience and education um, and tried to kind of reverse, if I could reverse, time reverse my own seminary classroom experience to make it stick, what might that look like? Now, what I'm proposing here, I don't have the opportunity to practice because I'm not in those classrooms, but you all are. So really, I look at this book as sort of a research proposal for you. What I would love to have happen is to have people read this and try a few things and let me know how it goes so my research can be ongoing as well. This is an ongoing conversation. This is not a set in stone because in reality, Medina will tell us we really don't know a lot about how the brain works. We got a lot of pictures. We got a lot of research. We got a lot of studies. But really, what do we know? Well, this is sort of what we know. Medina says, what we can say with certainty is that the brain was created to solve problems. So we're problem solvers related to surviving in outdoor settings, in unsustainable meteorological conditions, in almost constant motion. And he says further, humorously, If we were to create a learning environment that is the polar opposite to how the brain works, we would create a classroom. Thank you very much. And that's where we are. That's where we find ourselves. So because we don't actually know much of how the brain works, we have a lot of information, we can make some suggestions. And that's what this is, is some suggestions. Now, could we have... Could we have the book? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, like I said, I love words, but it would be wrong of me to fill up my limited time with just words because then I wouldn't be practicing what I've written about. So I'm going to invite you to do something sticky, okay? So I'm going to invite you to take a set of sticky notes. Each Each of these is a set of sticky notes. 
Okay? And you don't have to do it now, but I'm going to invite you to do it at some point. Oh, one more. Okay? I'm going to invite you to go through the five tips to sticky learning and sort of, I mean, even what I did, I had to go back and reread what I wrote. Anybody do that? You're like, oh gosh, I said that? That was really good. Um, I'm going to invite you to do something that helps you remember what each of these five tips for sticky learning are. And they begin on page 58. So what I've attempted to do is to compile a whole lot of information in a way that's um, palatable for folks who are not neuroscientists. I'm not a neuroscientist. I got a C in biology, but I know this is important stuff, and I know that we can find out who to read and help us. So the first tip for sticky learning is just stimulate more senses. Vision trumps all senses. 25% of our brain activity is related to our visual perception. Now, this has huge implications for what we do in a classroom, okay? I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on these, but that's the first one. The second one is on page 62. 62. Thank you. Can't find my own sticky notes. Connect to prior knowledge. The way we make things sticky is to assess what our students already bring into the learning experience and to hook what we want to communicate onto that prior experience. Now recognize that's not just prior knowledge, that's just not another class that they took, but that's their life experience or their own independent learning. Mm -hmm. So rather than starting out with our own agenda, we need to start out with the agenda of our own students' knowledge. Okay? So, number three is on page 65. Emotional memory trumps all other forms of memory. So if vision is king of the senses, emotion is the queen of the types of memory. Um, And this is nothing new that my two colleagues haven't already mentioned, that if we want something to stick, we make it emotional. We tell stories. We elicit emotions from our students that connect to the information. And this is really challenging in some seminary classrooms. How do you make all those... Hebrew, Greek, Greek things, oh, emotional. emotional. <laughs> Can you? Okay. Because I got to say, my seminary Greek did not have much emotional connection to me. I, I, I'm not your seminary. Thank you very much. I should have had you. I should have had you. Ah, there you go. So you're talking. All right. So number number four, find your core message and then repeat it with increasing depth. And this relates, I think, a lot to what what Brooks talked about. Um, Our short-term memory, um, the data tells us, has a capacity of between five and seven elements. It's sort of a phone number, if you can, you know, put that in your mind. So what I've challenged people in my world to do is to come up with a seven-word core message to perhaps a class that you're teaching. If you can't do it in seven words, keep going. And then don't let your students guess what your core message is. Tell them up front because then they use that to hook the information on. Now, I didn't tell you what my core message was because I kind of got off because we're a little off schedule. But here's my core message. We teach as we are taught. We teach as we are taught. So thinking back to my seminary experience, it's no wonder I had to struggle to understand what these neuroscientists are talking about because I was not taught, for the most part, in a memorable fashion. Okay? So, number five, you can find on page 73, and that's demonstrate relevance and create interest. Employ the 10-minute rule. Ah, if most pastors paid attention to this. (laughs) Most of us tune out after about 10 minutes. We just do. So at that point, in any sort of lecture or presentation format, we have to re-hook folks. We have to tell a story. We have to tell a joke. We have to put up a YouTube clip. The key is it has to be relevant. It has to be connected. It can't be random. How many sermons have you heard in which there was a joke told and you go, and what did that have to do with the text? Okay, maybe perhaps in your classrooms as well. But it's up to us as educators to establish the relevance so our learners don't have to keep asking, and why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. What does this have to do with anything? So establish the relevance for them. Further down on that page, I present some principles of hooks that I think are worth your consideration. 
if information isn't connected to prior knowledge, it isn't emotionally wired, and it isn't visually stimulating, this is really sad. We have about 90 seconds before it disappears. <laughs> so I invite you to do a sticky practice whenever. Stick some of those sticky notes on there. Draw little pictures on it. Whatever helps you remember those five tips to sticky learning. Then I really would like you to practice them. Tell me if I'm off base. Um, tell me if it doesn't work. Tell me what does work. Um, and let's keep the conversation going. Thanks for listening to the discussion with Holly Ingalls. To view the show notes for this episode or to leave a comment, head over to fplive.fortresspress.com forward slash 023. Fortress Press Live is available via iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher Radio, and YouTube, so be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform. Until next time, this is your host, Sean Tabbitt, signing off.